Okay, any questions on what we looked at in the previous section session? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Nina. Yeah. Um, one second. Yeah, I think your mic is muted. Uh, yeah, no, sorry. That I think actually it was by accident. But even I was, I was listening to some of uh, other mm, about. Uh, so one more thing that in. Uh, yeah. Uh, supporting um, thing, even if we don't understand, like it was coming out. I mean, different uh, when the others were say, mentioning about that. Mm. Uh, what I was uh, encouraged to say was that um, finally it does say, I mean, even if the understanding or even the interpretation is not there, mm. uh, it does say that we are, it does say in 12 that we are speaking mysteries. Right. So to God. So uh, and over a period of time, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I suppose you're praying specifically for any particular thing. I mean, yeah. it's so much more effective to switch over because it's only that much that we can pray and say articulate in words. Right. Maybe so many issues and so many things where you know the uh, work of the Spirit of God is required to you know whether it's a stronghold or so many things. Right. What we actually say in words, is, I would feel is so limited compared mm. to what the Spirit of God will be able to communicate. And True. we are, and it says that we speak, we are speaking to God. So mm. even if we don't understand whatever the Spirit is, uh, He's the one who's giving us the utterance and it True. is going directly to God. And so then... Right. There is so much of edification in that, actually, even if we don't understand what I'm saying. Of course, but we I think we can ask. And over yes. a period of time, it does come. Hmm. You, know, you kind of know that, OK, this is what the Lord is saying. Or it could be an answer from the scripture. Or right. in your spirit, you will know this is what it is. Like, you know, so exactly. it's not yeah. totally without any. It's not that we're just going on and on and on. It's not like hmm. that. I think. Hmm. So, yeah. But, yeah, so interpretation works that way. We can perceive in our spirit, and and yes, um, more importantly, knowing that you know we are being edified. You know there is that spiritual progress, that spiritual construction that's happening. So that's the beauty of it. And uh, like you rightly said, you know sometimes we don't know, you know, what aspect to be prayed for, uh, etc. But then the Holy Spirit makes that perfect prayer for us and. And so there's a great reassurance and therefore also great conflict, you know, for this particular one gift uh, where we see, you know, there's so much of attack and there's so much of conflict around this because uh, we know, you know, uh, the benefit it brings and uh, why God instituted it in the body. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, so we, we, we've read, we saw about the tongues part of it and also about the prophecy, right? Um, verse 29, 30, it's talking about the prophets. So which means he's talking about the ministry gift of the office of the prophet. So if there are prophets and if they want to speak, and again, you know, you take turns to speak. And here he's talking about judging, meaning you discern, you judge, you know, according to what they've said, what the prophet is releasing, speaking. Uh, is it in line with the word of God? Does it coincide with the word of God? Uh, does it go with the nature of God, the character of God? So we are called to judge. Now, you know, these are, you know, I would assume that these are people who are walking in the prophetic office, right? So let the prophet speak, but let the others judge, right? So. That's the responsibility of the church that one who's speaking, let them let them prophesy, but you judge. Why do we do that? We see that in 1 Thessalonians 5, where he says, you know, you judge all things, hold on to what is good, to see what is good, hold on to what is good. So we know that the prophetic word comes through, a, you know, a, the prophetic word is precious, it is pure, but it comes through a human vessel. So we, we judge it. And we receive it, we take it, um, you know, as we, um, once we judge it, we receive it, right? So 
Um, verse 31 again. For you can all prophesy. Right? He's talking about the church. You can all prophesy. So several things. Uh, prophecy is for everyone, every believer. So you can all prophesy. All may learn. So he's again talking about these are spiritual gifts. These are gifts of the Spirit. But we can learn the gifts of the Spirit. You know, the prophetic especially. It can be learned. Which means it can be taught. It can be received. Um, it can be uh, it can be learnt that all may be encouraged. So this is for all. You know, he said all can prophesy, all may learn, and all may be encouraged. So it's not for an exclusive few. It is for all. Okay. And verse thirty two: the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, meaning that hey, you are. It is under your control. You, know, you are under your control. You need to be self-disciplined. You can't just go on and do something, say something, and say that, you know, God made me do it, or I wasn't, uh, I wasn't in control. Whatever it says, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet, right? And also, the God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So, you know, this also we need to understand. God is not the author of confusion, but in Acts chapter two. When the Spirit of the Lord came upon the people, you know, everyone just praying out in tongues. And people thought that they were drunk. People thought that they were blabbering. Okay. So we need to understand that. When, when it talks about order, well, in a way, that's the picture that we have. You know, God's order, where there is... There is a stirring up of gifts. There is a release of gifts. There is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And there are things happening. And to the natural man, it seems like people are drunk. It seems like people are blabbering something. There is confusion. But God is not the author of any kind of chaos or confusion. But he's author of peace. But this is something that he poured out on the Spirit. I mean, poured out... On the people, so we need to, you know, keep that. Okay. To to me, will it seem like confusion when I see people you know, being poured out? You know, when the Holy Spirit being poured out on people and people praying in tongues and you know people saying some things and it seems like drunkenness and you know everybody's thinking these are drunk, these are mad. You know, does it seem like confusion to the natural mind? Yes, right. But to the spiritual mind, this is not confusion. Right? This is something that is. Uh, you know, something that is of the peace of God, right? So that verse also we need to keep it in context because some people say, okay, you need to be dignified, you know, orderly, and which means a lot of silence and reverence. Well, silence, reverence is part of worship, part of prayer. Bible says, you know, uh, let all the earth keep silent before God. Right. There is a moment, some, whole Psalms talk about Selah, where you pause and reflect on the beauty of God, the power of God. All that is part of it. But we also know that when God releases, pours out the Spirit, there's a lot of things that are happening which seem to be you know, not like order, seem to be confusion to the natural mind, but that is not it. Okay. So I just wanted to make that comment. Then, right? So um, so he talks about that. Okay. Then goes on to something that seems to be controversial, right? Um, so uh, it says in verse 34, let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church, right? So, so this again has been a very controversial thing taken out of context saying that women should not speak women should not be in ministry etc right so if you look at uh, chapter 11 like chapter 11 verse 5 uh, in the when it talks about head coverings and so on so he says he makes a very important statement he says that every woman who prays or prophesies so he's talking about a church setting he, every woman who prays or prophesies, we know that that was a cultural thing about head covering and praying and prophesying. But he's, he's making a very important statement that the woman or the women are praying and prophesying. Okay, So they are praying in church, they are prophesying in church, 
um, they are making use of the gifts in the church, right? So when he says, let your women keep silent in the church, definitely he's not against them praying, he's not against them prophesying, okay? Because he's saying, okay, all the gifts are for all, all can learn, all can be prophesy, all can be encouraged. So definitely he's not talking about this, uh, about even the gift of tongues, for he says, you know, you pray between yourself and God. So here it is specifically talking about some questions being raised, some disruption in the church service because of things that maybe the women did not understand and they wanted to ask their own husbands and so on. So, so that is uh, uh, so he's is also specifically addressing the the wife, right? So he's saying let them ask their own husbands at home. Okay? So uh, if you want to take the culture, we know that in the synagogue, there was a separation between the men and the women, like the separate seating. So the early church, you know, we can assume that they followed the same thing, like right? whatever was happening in the synagogue, and there was a separate seating. And here we see, you know, just imagine the scene where, where there were, you know, these women, and maybe they didn't understand what was being said, and they are you know, shouting across to their husbands and, uh, you know, maybe what they didn't understand or may maybe what they wanted to share, you know, that kind of a setting. So he's talking about something that was disrupting the service. And I remember reading an article about this particular uh, church. Some, I think it was a Middle Eastern or some kind of a thing where um, in some kind of a meeting where the women were very vocal and they were, you know, just talking across across the thing between each other and so on and the speaker literally had to you know calm them down and so on and and so this was a this was a cultural thing where they could openly ask etc but then this was disrupting the church so so he's saying let the women keep silent let them ask uh, you know let them ask their own own husband and so on right so um so it's 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 good to study where are the places where he says keep silent? Okay, because that will also give us an idea. Okay, because to the women he's saying keep silent, but at the same time in verse chapter eleven, verse five, he's saying okay, women pray, prophesy, uh, tongues. He's saying okay, if there's no interpretation, you speak to God, etc. Verse twenty-eight, one Corinthians fourteen, right? So, um, if you look at uh, you know one Corinthians fourteen verses twenty-seven and twenty-eight, right? Twenty-seven, where he's saying when there's no interpretation. Let that person, so again, a public uh, in, uh, speaking of tongues, he's saying, if there is, let there be two or three, each in turn, let them want to interpret, verse 28. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church. Okay, So there is also, he's saying, let him keep silent. Okay, And he says, let him speak to himself and to God. So it's not about absolute you know, quietness. There also he uses keep silent. Again, when it comes to prophecy, in the second part of the same thing, he says that, verse 30, if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. Okay, so there also he's using the word, same thing, you know, keep silent. Then, to the women, you know, if you are in church and if you need to ask anything, ask your husbands at home, um, keep silent. Okay, so he uses this, not only to the women, but also to different people in different areas. So we know, we know that it's the use of um, keep silent when it comes to praying in tongues, when it comes to prophecy, when it comes to you know the women disrupting the service in the church uh, at uh, that church in Corinth. So he is using this. So we need to understand it. So that is why he says, uh, let the women keep silent in church. Okay. So we need to understand that, and not really prohibit uh, women from praying or prophesying or ministering or speaking in the church okay okay so um verse 36 onwards uh till the end of it let's just read out um or did the word of god come originally from you or was it from only you that it reached if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual let him acknowledge that the things which i write to you are the commandments of the lord but if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, 
and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Okay, so um, so he's giving a strong word to those who are probably you know not really receiving this and continuing to do what they wanted to do, uh, being not being mindful of others in the church and so on. So he's saying you know, uh, well, if you think yourself to be a spiritual prophet, please acknowledge this. But these are the commandments of the Lord. Okay, so so we can also take it seriously. Okay, this is a this is not just a nice guideline, but it's actually a commandment of the Lord when it comes to these spiritual matters, the use of these spiritual gifts, right? And then the, the last couple of verses saying, desire earnestly again, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak with the tongues. So that's how it the whole thing. The whole subject matter of gifts ends, right? He's saying, let all things be done decently and in order. Because the, the gifts are for the edification of the church. And you so you seek to excel in this. What um, Let it be for the benefit of the church. Okay, so so that's how it ends. So, uh, so it answers a lot of questions that we might have about the use of spiritual gifts in the church, especially with regard to tongues and so on, right? Okay. Any questions here, or can we move on? You have a okay. Pastor, like for this uh, verse thirty-four, like let your let woman keep silent, and when we say it's, uh, it is only for the time, only for the church. Most people also like back it up with one Timothy, you know, two eleven where uh, yeah. Timothy uh, Paul says to Timothy like I personally won't mm. permit, and they'll ask like then what about? So how we can like? Yeah. So these are two churches. One is uh, the church in Ephesus, uh, the instruction for Timothy, and the church in uh, Corinth, right? So um, so both had similarities in the worship of the deities and so on and Corinth church we understand okay so when it comes to Timothy uh, let's just take a look at it okay so first Timothy uh, chapter 2 right chapter 2 yeah so it here this is also a similar thing where it talks about uh, one firstly he talks about um, uh, about adornment, physical adornment, right? Then about modesty and so on. And it says, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Okay. And uh, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, uh, but to be in silence, right? Um, and then it goes on to talk about, you know, childbirth, which is even more confusing. <laughs> it's, uh, the chapter ends like that. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbirth if she continues in faith, love, and with, uh, you know all that so uh, so one of the things that we understand is in Ephesus that there was this worship of this deity and I forget the name where uh, it was uh, goddess of fertility and uh, you know there was that fear that uh, if you you know because you leave the chair I mean you leave worshiping the deity deity that there will be something some harm done to the uh, during childbirth for the mother or for the child, there was that belief also. So he's addressing that, you know, that it's not a issue. You will be served in childbirth. You continue in faith, love, and holiness, etc. Right. Um, and here also, you know, you learn in silence and with all submission. And uh, he's talking again about the wife and the husbands. A similar. These are places with similar culture, non-Jewish, Gentile culture. With had the worship of these deities, uh, so so that is what he's addressing. So, you know, if if you actually go through um, First Timothy, uh, the end of it, he's he's addressing uh, women to be uh, reverent. He's addressing women to be, um, you know, is uh, is laying down other things also which are typical of that particular church. Know, not to be slanderous, not to be, uh, you know, all that, right? So he's addressing other things also apart from this. Um, so 
we know that it is for culturally for that particular place where there was this kind of disruption but if you look at other places where like priscilla and akila they taught apollos right? we read about tb of sankriya uh, the church in sankriya it says a servant of the church in sankriya which means an elder or a you know a spiritual leader there then we read about in romans chapter 16 is full of people there are a lot of women mentioned there uh, junia is an apostle mentioned there and you know so many mentioned there who were women in ministry in the book of acts we see philip's daughters who prophesied so we see that well the society at that time was a patriarchal society okay which means that the jewish culture was uh, society as, as such was kind of you know male dominated society we know that also right and uh, but at that same time here comes this freshness of the gospel where there is everything you know the call of god the gifts of god is for both men and women right so he is very clear and we read right through and we see women being engaged being involved in ministry and so so we need to look at it that way right yeah any other questions okay so um, you know some so, so, some tough issues right paul is addressing and all because chloe and household they went in complain <laughs> a lot of things happening in this church so he is addressing one by one all these issues okay so let's look at chapter 15 so in chapter 15 um you know after talking about the gifts and so on so he's talking about the reality of the resurrection so that was one more thing okay uh, reality will we rise up or is is this life the only thing and also you know uh, the the uh, the proof of the resurrection of christ and so on so there are questions um, around that so he's talking about that if we are resurrected how will we be you know those kind of things so we know that paul has already taught them you know in his 18 months there he has already taught them but these uh, this is a reiteration of that right he's reminding them uh, again right uh, let's look at uh, chapter 15 verses 1 to 8 he says moreover brethren i declare to you the gospel which i preached to you which also you received and in which you stand by which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which i preached to you unless you believed in vain for i delivered to you first of all that which i also received that christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen by cephas then by the 12 and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to be present but some have fallen asleep after that he was seen by james and then by all the apostles then last of all he was seen by me uh, also as one born out of due time so he's he's talking about what happened the kind of gospel that he preached to them um he's saying you need to hold fast to it you not you can't compromise on this uh, this is what i preached he says that christ died for our sin he was buried and he rose again according to the scripture so that's the whole thing he died he was buried he rose again so that is something that i delivered to you so hold fast to it don't be moved don't be shifted in your thinking and he gives additional proof he's saying you know he was seen by peter he was seen by the 12 he was seen by 500 people and if you have any doubt some of them are still living that is what he's saying you know most part most of them they are actually alive so they are eyewitnesses and saying i also had that encounter with jesus i heard the voice you know he heard the voice of jesus and so so he says i also uh, as uh, as one who persecuted now i also had this encounter so this is what the gospel is right that he died he was buried and he rose again for our sins right um then he goes on to say verse 9 to 11 for i am the least of the apostles who is who am not worthy to be called an apostle because i persecuted the church of god but by the grace of god i am what i am 
and his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. Okay, So he's talking about grace, he's talking about work, he's saying, you know, I was not worthy to be called an apostle, but I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. You know, that God has made me because of his grace. So we also understand, well, the grace of God empowers us, enables us to become all that God wants us to be. Right? The grace of God. When we understand, when we think about the grace of God, we know that grace of God means unmerited favor, something that we did not deserve. Right? The grace of God also means divine character. Right? Grace and truth came through Jesus. So divine character. But the grace of God also means divine enablement. Right? There is an impartation of grace. Divine enablement. Ephesians 4 talks about that. When we speak edifying words, there is an impartation of grace. So it's a divine enablement, right? Empowerment. So he's saying, I am what I am by the divine enablement of God. But look, look at the last second part of it. He says, His grace towards me what not in, was not in vain. He released that grace, he gave me that divine empowerment, but I labored more abundantly. Which means, God gave me the grace, but I worked, I cooperated, I worked with that grace. I labored more abundantly. Okay? Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So he's saying, God released the grace, but I worked. He says, he points out and says, I worked more abundantly than most people of my time. I worked more abundantly with the grace of God. And uh, even that ability to work more abundantly, he says, that was also the grace of God. Okay, So um, the reality is that God releases grace, but I need to work. Okay, That's something that we learn. I need to work, meaning I need to cooperate. God will give me revelation. I need to work at it to internalize it. I need to work at it to share it. So there is this working part of ministry uh, in addition to release of grace, it's not about striving, but it's about putting in that effort, right? Which is a reality. Right? So Paul talks about that, saying that in my life I received abundant grace, but I had to work. Right? The physical part of traveling, physical part of enduring, physical part of all the discomfort, you know, that he had to go through. You know, that is something that he worked at. Right? He traveled. He ministered. He he wrote to them, and even this epistle, you know, it takes time and effort, right? To write, to put to put it on paper, and to be disciplined, to record everything. And it's not like sending an email of today, you know, you it is painstaking work, putting it down, making sure somebody goes and delivers it. And it's not an easy journey, but you know, it's it's a dangerous journey. But still, he worked at it. Right? So that is something that we see. Now he addresses something. You know, um, and this is a question, the reality which was there, and some maybe a debate which was there in the church. He's saying now, uh, verse 12 to 19, right? Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, your faith is also empty. Yes, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then all those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So there was some question, there was some conversation in the Corinthian church saying that, you know, the dead do not rise. If you're dead, that's it. There's no resurrection. You know, some kind of, maybe it was some kind of belief that was happening there. Because the Corinthian church was, uh, I mean, the Corinthian culture was all about um, living for pleasure. You know, this life is all that you have. 
and so uh, you know do what you want physical pleasure is something that is you know of utmost importance and so on right so so maybe that kind of philosophy just went into the church also right so he's saying you know how can you say that there is no resurrection of the dead and he goes on to say if christ if there's no resurrection then christ is not risen if christ is not risen then you are still in your sins if we are still in your sins then there is no hope for us right and we are actually being false witnesses of god something that god did not do we are false witnesses that we are preaching something that is that god did not do and if you're talking about physical life and if you're putting your faith and hope in christ only for this time that we are here on earth then we are of all men most pitiable why because you're saying there's no life here after there's no destiny change in destiny and just to live a good life if you're going to you know going to put your faith in christ going to you know going through all this thing of consecration and and sacrifice and hardships and enduring everything of all the men we are most pitiable right what is the use right so he's saying you know if you if your faith in christ is something for today and till you live your life here that is most pitiable right it is not temporal in other words he's saying hey your faith is actually for eternity because your life has changed you are a new creation all those realities are there so it is for eternity it is not just for you know life alone here which means that there is a resurrection you know that is the thing that he's you know, talking about there is a resurrection right okay verse 20 now christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep since by man came death by man also came the resurrection of the dead for as in adam all die even so in christ all shall be made alive and each one in his own order christ the first fruits afterward those who are christ at his coming and then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of god the father when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet the last enemy that will be destroyed is death for he has put all things under his feet but when he says all things are put under him it is evident that he who has put all things under him is accepted now when all things are made subject to him then the son himself also will be made subject to him who put all things under him that god may be all in all okay so he's talking about christ being raised from the dead saying you know he was the first fruits which means the beginning of something that will happen to the rest of humanity okay the rest of, it's not automatic but the rest of humanity will also become or experience what he experienced in resurrection why because he says by man came death referring to adam adam sin the original sin came death everyone sinned but by man you know and that capital m is used there referring to jesus by man came the resurrection of the dead for in adam all die even so in christ all shall be made alive and he talks about you know christ the first fruits who believe in Christ after those who are Christ at his coming right so um so he's talking about he's also talking about the future about the millennial reign of Christ where all enemies will be brought under him so he's kind of talking about the end times as well so uh, say he's saying that Christ will reign God will put all things under his feet and he'll bring an end to all rule and authority and power and so on right so he's talking about that as well so so we know that okay he's taught them about the end times and uh, as we see here as we see in Thessalonians also uh, what will happen uh, uh, to people who die in Christ that they will be raised up and uh, all things will be made subject to Christ okay, so verses um, 24 to 28 right he's talking about the millennial reign of Christ when Christ will come and Christ will rule and reign and so on right um okay verse 29 onwards right 
so here's uh, he is addressing one particular custom or something some something that was done in the in the corinthian church right verse 21 says otherwise what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all why then are they baptized for the dead and why do we stand in jeopardy every hour i affirm by the boasting in you which i have in christ jesus our lord i die daily and if in the manner of men i have fought with beasts at ephesus what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die do not be deceived evil company corrupts good habits awake to righteousness and do not sin for some do not have the knowledge of god i speak this to your shame okay, so he's he's, a, he's addressing uh, uh, something that was happening particularly in corinth there were some people who were being baptized for the sake of those who were already dead okay so this is not something that is that the church uh, he's recommending for the church okay so there are you know again this verse taken out of context some people have believed in this thing called there is a middle ground like okay? there's a middle space between earth and being with God, there is this middle place of neutral place where this whole idea of purgatory, right? Where you do things for the sake of those who are in that area or in that space. And based on your works for them on their behalf, they will either go to he heaven or hell. You know, those kind of thoughts came out of this. Right? Okay, that you can do something here for the sake of those who are already dead now now that's that's not something that he's recommending right he's he's talking about resurrection and he's saying you know what will they do right and who are baptized for the dead if the dead don't why why are then they baptized so he's talking about some people who are outside of the church who are following this whole habit of baptism for the sake of those who are already dead and so the understanding is maybe they did not believe in Christ when they were not when they were alive, but now they are dead. Now those who are alive are taking baptism on their behalf. Okay. Now why did they do? Why did they take baptism? Because they wanted them to have a resurrection toward to life. They wanted them to rise up and be with Christ. Right. So he's saying even in that belief they believe in resurrection they believe in life after death yes it is a wrong thing that they are doing but even in them you understand that they have this concept of hey, there is a resurrection right and then he goes on to talk about his personal life you know why do i stand in danger why do i you know in in a way i die daily right my life is at risk daily why do i do that if there is no resurrection uh, and he says, you know, in e Ephesus, fought with bees. Um, you know, if the dead do not rise, then why are it, the whole thing is a waste? The whole thing is futile, right? So he's talking about the the, the core thing of resurrection, which is a belief uh, because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And he's saying, you know, this is a reality. Right? Even those who do not who are doing some wrong things, wrong beliefs, even they have this concept of resurrection from the dead so he's saying resurrection is a reality like resurrection from the dead is a reality so let there be no such conversations or talks about there's no resurrection so he's saying you know awake to righteousness do not sin and before that he says evil company corrupts good habits so which means that you've been believing right but something in your company something about other people's philosophies and beliefs that seems to have corrupted you Right, so don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and don't sin. And uh, he says, you know, I speak this to your shame. All right. Um, you know, uh, as we talk about the resurrection and uh, talk about enduring hardships, um, just a reference to Second Corinthians. You know, he also talks about um, the same thing 
about the reality of resurrection because of which he endures the present troubles because of which he endures the present hardships second corinthians 4 verse 16 okay therefore we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing yet the inward man is being renewed day by day for our right light affliction which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen but at things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporary the things which are uh, but the things which are not seen are eternal so uh, you know he's uh, in in second corinthians also he addresses that okay then he goes on to address in verse 35 um, talks about the now someone is, is again you know saying okay there is this question if the dead rise up what kind of body will they have how will they look right what kind of body so he's addressing that right verse 35 but someone will say how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come foolish one what you sow is not made alive until it dies and what you sow, you do not sow that body which shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. And the glory of the terrestrial is one, celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is one. He's talking about heavenly earthly so heavenly is celestial earthly terrestrial there is one glory of the sun verse 41 right uh, another glory of the moon another glory of the stars and one star differs from another in glory so he's you know from 36 to 41 he's talking about um, the the body of one who will be raised up okay so he's saying okay if you you know in the physical when you sow a seed when it comes out fully grown it is not the same as it was when it was sown so he's saying that it's going to be a different body it's going to be a spiritual body it's going to be a glorified body in the resurrection right so he's talking about earthly things he's talking about heavenly things he's talking about the flesh of animals birds fishes and also about the moon and the sun and how each one has its own glory and own you know it's a, it's a different body it's 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 it has its own glory beauty and glory and so on and so also it is when it's in the resurrection okay verse 42 it says so also is the resurrection of the dead the body is sown in corruption it is raised in incorruption it is sown in dishonor it is raised in glory it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Okay, so it's talking about you know how a person dies and maybe there was some physical infirmity and this, you know, they might there will be decay and disease, whatever, and persecution, and because of which you know a person is martyred and so on. So the body is sown in corruption, but when the body is raised up, it is in corruption. In corruption means the body is not capable of decay, right? There is no decay, there is no disease. It is raised in, in corruption. Raised in glory, it's raised in power, right? So in corruption, glorious, power, it raised in power. It is a spiritual body, verse 44, right? It's a spiritual body. So this is the kind of body with which a person who dies and is resurrected, this is the kind of body that they have. It's a spiritual body, it's a, it's a body of power, it is a body that is glorious, and it is not capable of decay, incapable of decay and disease and corruption. Right. So that's great news, right? Um, verse 45 it says, so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual was not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also those who are made of dust. 
and as is the heavenly man so also those who are heavenly and as we have borne the image of the man of dust we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man right so what do we learn from this he's saying is talking about the first man adam and the last man jesus how adam became uh, you know became a living being but the lord jesus is a life giving spirit so there is the natural that happens and there is a spiritual okay so first man made of the earth made of dust and we bear that image right we are also uh, physical you know we have the flesh we have the physical and if you look at the physical body you know there are things that are of the dust you find iron you find all these things chemicals that are in the dust you know which are in in our body which is also goes to prove that yeah we are of the dust right so as we bear the image of the earthly man so he says you know now the spiritual body is going to be incapable of disease decay it is going to be of power glorious and so on but we will also bear that same image that we are going to have that same physical a uh, same spiritual body this is how our resurrected body is going to be so he's answering questions about will there be a resurrection yes and he's also giving proof of the resurrection of the lord jesus in the first part right he's saying okay this is what it is peter saw disciples saw 500 people saw and you know that people are alive i saw i'm here to tell you that there is the resurrection if there's no resurrection there is no hope everything is futile empty you might as well live however you want because tomorrow you die and that's the end but we know that that is not it right because of the reality of resurrection and if somebody asks okay okay you're saying yeah we can be resurrected but how will we be in the resurrection how will our bodies be so there also and he's giving the explanation how we bore the image of the first adam who was from the earth we will bear the image of the last adam the living christ spiritual body incapable of incorruption and so on right okay um verse 50 onwards says now this i say brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god nor does corruption inherit corruption behold i tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet shall sound and the dead will be raised in corruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption this mortal must put on immortality and when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory o death where is your sting o hades where is your victory the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law but thanks be to god who gives us the victory through our lord jesus christ therefore my beloved brethren be steadfast immovable always abounding in the work of the lord knowing that your labor is not in vain in the lord okay so some important uh, aspects of the truth that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god so there is, needs to be a change there will be a change because we are born of the earth and we are what is born of the earth will go back to the earth will undergo corruption because we are of the first adam you know body is yes it is bound to be you know decay and all that over a period of time it has an expiration date but he's saying you know i tell you mr verse 51 we shall not all sleep not all will die those who are those who are still alive at the coming of the lord they will be changed right this corruptible will put on in corruption mortal will put on immortality and he talks about the reality of that like this victory it comes through our lord jesus christ so he's encouraging them saying you know don't be derailed by all these thoughts of resurrection is not happening etc be steadfast immovable always abounding in the work of the lord your labor in the lord is not vain in the lord right so with that we come to the end of uh, chapter 15 um yeah we can actually uh, take some questions in our next class about chapter 15 right about death and resurrection and so on okay
um yeah nina okay about goddess and Art artemis at ephesus i guess yeah thank you okay so we'll stop here and we'll continue next class